What does a church look like that loves, pours into, and believes in the next generation? We had a powerful experience this year with our junior high and high school students at Valley Camp. We traveled up the mountain to Globe where so many students and leaders encountered God in a personal way. Our theme was nothing wasted to honor the lives of two of our youth leaders who went home to be with Jesus just a few months back. The first night, our students were encouraged to not accept the labels the world gives, but how God wants us to accept the labels He gives us. The second night was all about issues regarding mental health and the war going on in the minds of young people. The third night, we talked about Joseph and how not a moment of his pain and suffering was wasted, but used as steps to get him to the palace. We ended with the last night session encouraging students to not do life alone, that the power of the Holy Spirit is available to every single believer to fight any and every battle we face. We had about 200 people across camps and so many students who gave their lives to Christ. Some who even accepted the call to full-time ministry. That wouldn't have been possible without the generosity and faithfulness of those who call Pure Heart home. On behalf of Heart Youth, thank you to every single one of you who make it possible for our students to experience God in these kinds of ways. Well, hey, welcome to Pure Heart. We are so glad you're tuning in with us here today. If you like what you've seen so far, make sure you connect with us, but we still have a wonderful lineup for you. We have our special guest here with us and a very close friend, Pastor Rich Hendricks, joining us for the message today. And then we're gonna gather and worship together wherever we are, and then we'll come back right at the end. So we'll see you at the end. Hey, Pure Heart family, it is my pleasure to be with you this weekend and share with you the good news about Jesus Christ. I want to talk to you this weekend about who doesn't love a good story, a good story with interesting characters and an engaging plot, maybe even a twist or two in the storyline. The best stories seem to have a final chapter that leaves you smiling, saying, man, I didn't see that coming. I love stories like that. I've read every Lee Child story about Jack Reacher and all the Mitch Rapp stories written by Vince Flynn. I've read every John Grisham novel uh, that he's ever written, and I love the character Gabriel Allen by Daniel Silva. I've even read the Alphabet Mysteries written by Sue Grafton. Uh, I've started reading the Patricia Cornwell Medical Examiner Mysteries, which are very cool and very interesting. John Scalzi's my favorite science fiction writer. But I don't want to talk about those kind of stories today. I want to tell you about a storyteller who told the most amazing stories in human history. Jesus was an engaging storyteller. As far as we know, he never wrote down any of his stories, but his official biographers did, putting into print some of his very best stories. In fact, of the four official biographies of Jesus included in the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there are dozens of stories Jesus told. Interestingly, there's only one sermon that he preached, but many stories. Truth is, I've been preaching for a long time now, and if I had it to do over, I think I'd tell more stories and preach fewer sermons, but that's for another day. Today, I want us to listen to one of Jesus' stories, and it's one of my favorites and one of the best love stories. Now, don't discount this story because it isn't actual history. It's a story. It's a story that Jesus made up. The characters are made up. The plot line is made up. All of it is made up, but for the purpose of communicating an important idea. In fact, it may be more powerful because Jesus felt the need to make up a story like this in order to teach something about ourselves and about God. The literary term for these short stories that Jesus told so many of is parable. They, they were stories intended to make a single point. Uh, they are not historical characters, but they are powerfully important. And Jesus told lots of them. Well, let me read you uh, some of this story from Luke chapter 18, beginning with verse 9. Then Jesus told this story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everyone else. 
Here's his story. Two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee. The other one was a despised tax collector. Well, before I go on with the story, let me give you a little background. The, the, the writer, Luke, the historian, the biographer of Jesus, says this story is specifically targeted by Jesus to people who were confident in their own self-righteousness. He told this story for those who thought they had life wired and they had God figured out and their lives were perfect. And it says that he told this story to them to confront their self-righteousness and also to confront the fact that they despised others for their sinfulness. This story becomes a cautionary tale for those who are self-righteous. I want you to hear that. For those of us who think we've done most things right in life, this is a cautionary tale for us. But it is also a story of hope for those who know they've messed up. Because of the two characters in the story, one was nearly perfect, the other admitted that he'd made a mess of his life. And Jesus speaks to both of them. And today, when you hear this story, you may identify with one or the other of these two characters. Either the one who says, I've done everything right in life, or the one who admits that they've messed up. So this is a two-character story. Uh, and like most two-character stories, there's a good guy, a hero, a role model, and there's a bad guy. Now, the good guy in this story is a Pharisee. He's wealthy, he's influential, he looked good, dressed right, he was respected, admired. In fact, lots of moms wanted their sons to grow up to be a Pharisee. And he's the good guy in the story, as far as anyone listening to the story would, would tell. And there's a bad guy in the story, a tax collector. The hated, villain, bad guy. Uh, considered a traitor by most people in Israel, known as a cheat, uh, had lots of wealth, but it was all ill-gotten, and he was looked down on by most of his neighbors and most of the people that he had cheated. So when Jesus crafts this story with these two characters, he has drawn a story of stereotypes. The one a good guy, like a lawyer. The other a bad guy, like a drug dealer. And yet he tells this story in such a way that's going to leave you scratching your head and saying, Who's the good guy and who's the bad guy? So the story begins with the two of them going to the temple to pray. Um, that's simple to understand and everybody gets that that was a place of prayer. It was a place to meet God. And so the Pharisee went to the temple, the bad guy went to the temple, and both of them prayed. Jesus unpacks their prayers this way. Verse 11 of Luke 18. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I am not like other people, cheaters, sinners, adulterers. I'm certainly not like that tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give you a tenth of my income. So here's this guy beginning his prayer, and he addresses God, but then he reads him his resume. Not God's resume, his own resume. He says, I've done a lot of good and I've avoided a lot of bad and I, I am pretty good at spotting the sins of other people and I don't think I have any of my own. And this is his prayer? This is what he wants to say when he has the ear of the God of the universe? The good guy's prayer was self-righteous. It started by addressing God, but really the only thing he talked about was himself. Um, all the negative things he didn't do, all the positive things he did, and, and the conclusion, though it's not stated, is implied that God is awful lucky to have him on his side. And this prayer really wasn't about a relationship with God. It was just a boastful reading of his own resume. Verse 13 tells about the second character in the story. But the tax collector stood at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, Oh God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. Here's the bad guy's humble honesty. Um, his posture was humble. It would not even look up to heaven. Interestingly, when you read about prayer in the Bible, now, most of us were trained and raised to close our eyes when, I pray, when we pray, and I, I think that's probably because we are easily distracted. Um, look, a squirrel. Uh, by all the things around us, and it probably makes sense for us to close our eyes. But if you read in the Bible, most people who prayed lifted their eyes and looked toward heaven. Well, this man, knowing who he was and recognizing who God was, wouldn't even raise his eyes to look to heaven. He instead, his eyes were downcast, he beat his chest in humility, and he addressed God simply with this prayer, O oh God, 
have mercy on me. And then he adds, because I recognize I am a sinner. This is one of the hardest things for some people to admit. Uh, Now, some of us don't have a hard time recognizing and admitting and acknowledging our sinfulness. But for some of us, this is the hardest statement we will ever make, admitting to God that we've blown it, that we've been selfish, that we've been dishonest, that we've been unfair, that we've been unkind, that we've been unjust, that we've been, you name it. And for some of us, we would rather not think about it or admit it to ourselves or to God. But this guy did. And he's the bad guy in the story, but he admitted that he was a bad guy. He admitted his guilt. He admitted that he was a sinner. In fact, it's really interesting. If you read the Greek text where he says, God be merciful to me, a sinner, literally the Greek text says, God be merciful to me, the sinner. Isn't that interesting? He thought of himself as the guy who has done wrong. He probably couldn't even remember all the people that he'd cheated. Um, He probably couldn't remember all the things that he'd done wrong. And he only asked God for one thing. He asked for mercy. Stop for just a second and ask yourself, who asks for mercy? Who won't even look up to heaven but admits their need and says, God, the one thing I want from you today is mercy. I'll tell you who asks for mercy. The one who knows he needs it. The one who admits he doesn't deserve it. I was talking to a person one time about the goodness of God and how much God loves him. And I said, "Um, God is waiting to show mercy to you. And he said, but I don't deserve it. And I said, exactly, that's the point of the story. People who deserve it don't need it, and those of us who don't deserve it desperately need the mercy of God. So here's this guy not only admitting to himself, but admitting to God. One time years ago, I was working with a college student who had just come to faith in Christ, and and, uh, we were trying to get on a path of following Jesus for him, and and he had some issues in his life and some things that he struggled with, and he came to me one day and and confessed a sin that he was so embarrassed about and ashamed of and and really didn't want to continue doing, and and we talked together, and I assured him about the love of God, and then I said to him, let's pray together and, and tell God, and he said, oh no, don't tell him. Well, come on, you know he knows already. There is something helpful and healing when we say to ourselves, I'm the sinner. But there is something cleansing when we say to God, be merciful to me. I've made more than my share of mistakes. Well, then this story in verse 14 shows a surprising ending. And I love surprise endings. Uh, Jennifer and I read a lot of fiction. And uh, we are forever recommending fiction titles and fiction series and fiction authors to each other. And uh, often she'll read one first and then I'll read it or I'll read it first and then she'll follow up and read it. And often when we talk about the books that we've read afterwards, um, I will invariably say to her, I was surprised by that ending. I didn't see that coming. Um, Nine times out of 10, she said, oh, I figured that out about chapter 14. Well, I never figure it out. I never see it coming. And I will tell you that in this story in Luke 18, verse 14 is a surprising ending that I didn't see coming. And here's the best part. Neither did the people who heard Jesus tell it the first time. Remember this. This was a story he told intending the listeners to be the people who are convinced of their own goodness, their own self-righteousness. Here's how Jesus ends the story in Luke 18, verse 14. He says, I tell you, this sinner, the bad guy, the villain, the tax collector, not the Pharisee, the hero, the good guy, this sinner, not the Pharisee, returned, returned home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. When Jesus says, I tell you, that's, that's um, like him verifying some unexpected truth. This is him declaring something that you wouldn't have thought. At least his first century Jewish listeners would not have expected. Because in their hearing of this story, the Pharisees, the good guy, the tax collectors, the bad guy, and for Jesus say, to say that the bad guy went home justified with God, healed and forgiven and cleansed and made new. And the good guy, the Pharisee, went home completely unchanged. This was an unexpected truth. 
When he says he went home justified before God, what he meant was simply this, and this is probably the most important thing you'll hear me say today. In confessing our sins and acknowledging our need of a Savior, we are justified before God. Hear me out on this. It's not our own goodness. It's not even our righteousness, because there are things in our lives that are absolutely right and righteous, but that's not what justifies us with God. What justifies us with God is receiving his mercy, accepting what Jesus accomplished on the cross for us in paying the penalty for our sin and setting us free from the burden of our sin. So in this surprise ending, what'd you hear? One of the things I love about this story and all great stories is that it speaks different things to different people. I told you Jennifer and I read a lot of the same stories. And oftentimes I will say, well, this is what that story was about and this is what it meant to me. And she said, oh no, it was about this and this is what it meant. And I tell you that today this story with two characters, a simple three paragraph story with only two characters, there are messages for lots of different perspectives. And lots of people will hear this in their own unique way. So what's your story today? Which of these two characters do you identify with? The self-righteous one with an impressive resume? Uh, come on, be honest. Are you one of those people that says, yeah, I've done most things right in life. I, I have followed the rules and I've lived according to righteousness most of my life. I've done mostly good and a few things bad. You see, this story Jesus told were for people like us. Um, I can even say that this was a story for lots of church people. Church people who were relying on their own goodness and their own self-righteousness. God's not very impressed with our resume, and it doesn't justify us with a righteous God. Or are you today the person who knows how much you've messed up? Do you identify with the tax collector? The person who, when you pray, really all you can think of to say is, Oh God, Show mercy. Have mercy on me. I need it. I know I don't deserve it. And, and in this telling the story, Jesus is giving us permission to ask for mercy. Not because we deserve it, but because we don't deserve it. Not because we don't need it, but, but because we desperately need it. Either way, whichever character you identify with, however you have heard this story today, you can go home a different person than the one who came here today, simply by being honest with yourself and God and asking for his mercy, the thing he loves to give most. It is mercy and forgiveness that God loves to give most. You know, most stories, even ones with a good, happy ending like this one, have a, a sad tinge to them. And the saddest part of this story is that the self-righteous character, after that obnoxious prayer of reading his resume to God, went home from the temple, the place of prayer, that day completely unchanged. He left no better than when he arrived. He left unchanged from how he arrived. In fact, being in the presence of God and offering prayers to God made no difference for him whatsoever. It would be a tragedy if you watched this message and listened to this story and walked away unchanged. It would be a sad ending to your story to say, I heard this story, but it really didn't touch me. It really didn't get to me in any way. Who do you identify with? What's your story? Let me give you a handful of takeaways to think about. Uh, four of them, in fact. Here's the first one. If you are a person who's done a lot of good, like the Pharisee, Hear me on this. Let your good deeds speak for themselves. You don't have to announce them. You don't have to put them up on social media. You don't have to tell people what you've done or who you are or how good you are. And especially, hear me on this, you do not need to tell God how righteous you are. He knows who you are. You see, the problem is it's possible to do good in a way that does no good. It's possible to do good and then invalidate the good by bragging about it. So if you've done some good in this life, if you stayed married to the same person, if you faithfully paid your taxes, if you've been a good employee, if you're a good neighbor, if you have shared Christ with people around you, if you have loved people who are hard to love, good for you. 
But don't announce it. Don't post it. Don't brag about it. Here's the second takeaway. Looking down on others the way the Pharisee did toward that sinner may keep you from looking honestly at yourself. Looking down on others may inhibit you from looking deeply into your own life. You see, we aren't justified by finding others that we can condemn. If you're looking for people who have messed up more than you, yeah, that's easy to do. There are lots of options all around us. Maybe even members of your own family. Um, maybe people who live in your neighborhood or work in your office. If you're looking for people to look down on, there's no shortage all around you. But that does you no good, and it does them no good. We aren't justified by hoping that God grades on the curve and say, well, I may not be perfect, but I'm sure better than that sinner. Let me give you a third takeaway. Don't miss out on mercy because you think you don't need it. Don't miss out on mercy because you think you don't have anything to apologize for. I heard recently an interview with a pretty important national figure. I won't name him. But the question was, uh, have you ever asked God for forgiveness? And his answer was, I never thought I had anything to ask for forgiveness of. Wow. Um, most of us wouldn't say that. Most of us would admit that we've got stuff in our lives that we're not proud of. So today, if you're hearing this story, don't miss out on mercy because you think you don't need it. We all do. Mercy only comes to those who know they don't deserve it, but admit that they need it. Which is the fourth takeaway. Don't miss out on mercy simply because you don't deserve it. None of us do. This story that Jesus told was for those who were self-righteous, but hear me, it was also for those who had messed up in life and knew they needed mercy. When my kids were younger, I raised two boys, Jennifer and I did, and they both played Little League. And uh, we spent a lot of time in the bleachers watching Little League. And, and one of the things that was in Little League was uh, something called the mercy rule. If, if one team was like, I think, 10 runs ahead um, by the fourth inning, uh, they would call the game um, because there was no way the other team was going to catch up. And it was just a thing about sportsmanship and, and teaching some kindness and humility to little kids playing Little League baseball. And uh, the, the mercy rule um, applies to those of us who are at least 10 runs behind in life and who know it and recognize that we don't deserve it, but boy, do we need it. And if you're having trouble today saying, yeah, but you don't know my story. You don't know where I've been. You don't know what I've done. You don't know all the things that I've said or thought or the people that I've heard or hurt or the decisions that I've made that I now regret. Here's the truth. I don't. But the one who extends mercy does. And he has already forgiven you. He just wants you to know that that forgiveness is available. One of my favorite verses is from Isaiah 65, verse 2. It is a picture of God. In Jesus Christ, it says, All day long I open my arms to rebellious people. I don't know if you tend to think of God as standing like this, watching you, just hoping you'll blow it so that he can deal with you in a harsh way. That's not the God who sent his son Jesus into the world. This is the God who sent Jesus to us. Arms spread wide, ready to forgive, ready to welcome, ready to accept. So today, before I let you go, I want to invite you to respond to this message, either as a person who maybe has some self-righteous stuff going on that you need to confess, Maybe your prayer is not simply, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, but it's, God, be merciful to me, a self-righteous churchgoer. Or maybe you're that person who says, I've got so much to confess. Can God ever forgive me? I want you to know he can. He does. He will. He has. It's yours for the receiving. Simply by saying, God, be merciful to me the sinner. He will pardon you. He will forgive you. He will give you a whole new life. And then he will put his spirit inside of you and give you the ability to live a different kind of life, to live a different sort of way, so that your prayer isn't continually, here I am again, but rather, thank you, God, for the healing grace in my life that has let me live a different kind of life. The 
today I invite you to take that kind of step, to make that kind of decision that says, I welcome and receive with open hands the mercy of God. I sure need it. And I accept it in the person of Jesus. Let me pray for us together. Lord, whatever good I've done in my life, I've done because I love you and I want my life to count for something important. I apologize for the times I've bragged to others about what I've done right and for the times I've tried to cover up and hide from you what I've done wrong. I'm sorry that at times I've only felt good about myself by feeling superior to other people around me. Right now, the only thing I'm asking you for is mercy believing that it is only your kindness that justifies me. I believe with all my heart that this is a prayer you will hear and answer. In Jesus' name, amen. And I'll search the world But it couldn't fill me Man's empty praise, treasures of faith are never enough. And you came along and put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied here in your love.
Wasn't that a great time of worship? Thanks for hanging out with us here today. If you made a decision to follow Jesus, let us know by going online and telling us that you made a decision today to follow Jesus. We would love to connect with you. There's plenty of ways to give on your screen through the buttons. We want you to subscribe, share this video. We would love to see you right back here next week. Thank you so much for watching all the way through. We pray that this leaves you encouraged and ready to enter into another amazing week. Don't forget to connect with us via our online connect card found on our website, pureheart.org, where you can give as well to the mission and vision of Pure Heart. Remember, it's okay not to be okay, but it's not okay to pretend, and it's not okay to stay stuck. We'll see you guys next weekend.